everything goes haywire because of the leakiness in the gut, all of the metabolic symptoms. And, and even the American Diabetic Association has now published papers that conclude that obesity and diabetes is initiated by leaky gut. Wow. And no. the translation <laughs> valve, yes, right? That's the That's American crazy. Diabetic Association. Yeah. So it, welcome back, you guys. My name is Sarah. If you don't know me already, I'm known as Carnivore Yogi over on Instagram. Today, this is a little mini episode of a longer conversation I had with Kiri and Krishnan over at Microbiome Labs. And I'll be perfectly honest with you guys, this conversation really challenged a lot of my beliefs about diet and healing. So I think you'll find it really interesting. This is just a small snippet of a longer conversation. In this small snippet, I actually discussed with him the results I got from my Thrive Gut Health Test that basically said that my microbiome was one that would cause me to hold on to weight, essentially to be heavy. I did a video about that just a couple of weeks ago, which I'll link below this one. But I really wanted to dig deeper with him and see if there was validity to the microbiome making us hang on to weight and making it harder to just maintain a normal weight. I've really struggled over the last 10 years. So this is a little snippet of that. I hope you'll enjoy it. And if you want to watch the full episode, I encourage you to follow the links in the comments and the information section for the full podcast episode. I am just starting my podcast. I will probably put these full episodes back up on YouTube in a few months once I get my podcast going. But um, thank you so much for being here for watching and make sure you check out the full episode. The other, you know, I heard you on Dr. Jocker's podcast talking about this uh, leaky gut causing a sort of insulin resistance, even in very lean people. That was fascinating to me. And I wonder, you know, how many people that are switching to, you know, a high fat diet or s switching from diet to diet to diet, because it doesn't matter what they're eating. Yeah. They're unable to lose the weight or they're having the blood sugar issues. Um, could you speak on that? Because I just found that so fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I think we're, we now have a, a better and better understanding, and I can talk about a study we did on this as well, uh, a better and better understanding of what is really causing weight issues in people, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and again, it's not necessarily diet like the way we thought of it. Um, it, it, you know, lifestyle, of course, plays a certain role, but what aspect of lifestyle, right? Do we need to be working out two hours a day, five days a week to stay healthy, right? Just to stay of normal body mm -hmm. composition, yeah. right? Forget trying to be an Instagram model that's all ripped and, 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 you know, looking all sexy. We're talking about just trying to maintain normal, healthy weight is a struggle for people, right? Yeah. Think about all the, the energy that has to go into dieting and exercising and all that just to maintain, right? We're not all trying to win fitness contests. We're just trying to maintain. Yeah. So does that make any sense at all, right? That's not how the human form was developed. We are, we are actually naturally developed to be quite muscular and quite lean uh, throughout our lifespan, right? We shouldn't have to work for it. That's the point, right? We are designed to be lean and muscular without working for it. So the fact that we have to work so hard for it means that there's an inherent issue within the system. Now, there are, there's been, uh, you know, a decade ago, a bunch of studies on what we call discordant twins, right? So these are identical twins. So they have 100% the same genetics. The only difference that they have is one twin is very lean and the other twin is overweight, mm -hmm. right? And, and this occurred naturally through their lifestyle and whatnot. Um, but the big question is, if their genetics are 100% the same and they grew up basically in the same household eating the same things, why is one twin um, obese and overweight and why one twin completely lean and has not struggled with weight at all? So in order to understand that, what they did is they took these something called nobiotic mice. So these are mice that have been raised with no microbiome right? So they're basically sterile mice. And so you can, you can implant different organisms into them to see what the impact of that organism is. So with the, the initial studies with the discordant twins were they would take um, the microbiome from the obese twin and they would take the microbiome from the lean twin and they would implant them into different sets of, uh, of the same, genetically the same mice. And then they would feed the mice the same exact food, same number of calories, same frequency, and they found that the mice that got the obese twins microbiome always gain weight. Wow. The mice that got the lean twins microbiome always stayed lean, no matter what they fed them. 
right? Wow. And so, so it wasn't diet dependent, at least on the mouse level. And, and it wasn't lifestyle dependent because it wasn't based on activity and so on. Um, it was one mice, one set of mice that had the obese twins microbiome always put on weight, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what they ate. And so then they would do the reverse. So then they would, they would give the mice antibiotics to kind of wipe out the microbiome. And then they would switch them. They would take the obese mice and they would take the lean twins microbiome and implant it. And then they would take the, uh, the lean mice and they would put the obese twins microbiome. And sure enough, the compositions would change. Wow. The obese mice would start to lose weight no matter what. The lean mice would start to gain weight, right? So they've done many variations of this kind of study. So it became very clear that there were things within the microbiome that are influencing how your body responds to food, right? And, and, and that is really the clear picture of metabolic health. So going back to your question about leaky gut, leaky gut and, and the translocation of something called LPS. Now, what does that mean for your audience, right? So that means when your gut is leaky, the barrier system is not acting like a barrier. Things are allowed to leak through. There's an endotoxin that's being made in your microbiome all the time. And it's perfectly fine that it's being made because if your gut lining is healthy, it's just supposed to be removed through defecation, right? So it goes out in your poop. But if your gut is leaky, that endotoxin is going to leak through and enter your circulation, right? Uh -huh. When that endotoxin enters your circulation, it causes a number of issues. Uh, one of the ones that you alluded to in your question was something called central insulin resistance, Yes. right? Which normal insulin resistance is understood as your pancreatic cells, your islet cells that make insulin start to become dysfunctional and they make less and less insulin, right? So then your glucose control goes haywire. And when your glucose control goes haywire, that's the onset of all kinds of metabolic issues. You'll put on more fat, your metabolism will slow down and so on. <clears throat> Not to mention all the other disease risks, but that typically is associated with having put on weight, right? So typically you put on weight, you're obese for a period of time, then your insulin resistance comes on board because your islet cells start to, dis to become dysfunctional. Now, what they've shown is that with the leaky gut and the LPS in circulation, the LPS can actually migrate up to the brain, go past the blood-brain barrier, embed itself in the hypothalamus where, the, where all of this central control happens and create inflammation in the hypothalamus where the brain can no longer read your blood sugar levels, right? Wow. So your cells are sending blood sugar readings to your brain, but your brain can't interpret it. It doesn't know what your blood sugar levels. So your brain cannot then send hormone signals back for insulin production or glucagon production. So you have no ability to control your blood sugar. And then you start to actually get this um, insulin resistance, diabetes insulin resistance, which is irrespective of body weight. It's now happening in 18 year olds who are mm -hmm. perfectly lean and healthy. Now they're showing up with type two diabetes, wow. right? And that's driven by leaky gut. Now at the same time, what that LPS is doing, it's actually going in and it, it, it um, engages with your visceral fat cells yes. and it swells your visceral fat cells to almost three times the volume right? Wow. So it actually increases the, uh, what, what we call edipogenesis, and that's the formation and the swelling of your fat cells. So it's driving insulin resistance, so it's driving diabetes, and it's causing your fat cells to actually swell and incorporate in more fat, right? Wow. Now it's also doing other things. Um, it's it's um, completely skewing your ability to uh, read satiety signals, yes. right? So it causes inflammation in the brain and a disruption in the gut-brain connection. So when your gut sends signals up to the brain that, hey, plenty of food has come in, stop eating, the brain doesn't read that signal. So your brain keeps producing leptin, which is the hung, which is, uh, sorry, um, ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone. So you always feel hungry. You always feel like you need to eat, right? And so it causes overeating. Mm -hmm. And then you don't get the leptin signal, which is the satiety hormone. The brain doesn't send that signal because it can't read the satiety that's going on in the gut. So you don't get the satiety signal and you continuously get the hunger hormone. Now, one of the problems of not getting the satiety signal is that satiety signal is coupled with fat burning instructions. Right, so when when leptin goes up, which is a satiety signal, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to go uh, go in uh, go up 
in concert with the hunger hormone going down, right? What is what also tends to happen is not only do you feel satiated, so you stop eating and you back away from the food. What what also happens is it turns on something called AMP kinase. Mm -hmm. AMP kinase sends a signal to your whole body to start burning fat for fuel, right? It's a post eating signal that says, okay, we've got plenty of calories that came in. We're going to start metabolizing food in the system, which is very energy uh, expensive. And then the rest of the body is supposed to start burning fat for mm -hmm. fuel. So we don't take away from the energy that's required in the gut to, to, to um, do the metabolism and the digestive process. Right. So, so it, it's, it's, it's massive. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's something we have been working on, you know, um, one of the studies that we did that we concluded at the beginning of last year, uh, it's not yet published and we hope to publish it sometime in the near future. Uh, but our whole thinking is, can we do something called what I call metabolic reprogramming, right? Mm, yeah. So that is um, taking somebody who has a microbiome that supports weight gain, insulin resistance, all of that stuff, uh, and then shifting the microbiome so that they respond differently to food. Mm -hmm. Kind of a similar idea around the, the, the mouse experiment without implanting them with a new microbiome, right? So right. the idea is, can we change their microbiome enough where no, even though they're still eating the same foods that make them overweight, um, that they will, they will still lose weight, right? Mm -hmm. Without adding exercise, without changing their diet, right? That was the idea. Um, the whole pr point is if you can change the microbiome, you can change how your body responds to food. Got it. So, so we took, um, it wasn't a large study. It was about 28, 29 individuals who were all overweight. So their BMIs were above the threshold for weight and they were non-active individuals. So they've been struggling with weight for a long time. They were overweight, uh, measurably by DEXA analysis as well. We did the dual x-ray screening, right? To, to, to measure the body fat percentage. Um, and, and they had poor eating habits, right? They ate a lot of fast food, they ate a lot of snacks, all of those processed things that we are all not, we know are not good. So we gave them the spores and we gave them a single prebiotic, one that mm. we know modulates a microbiome in a favorable way for metabolism. We also know the spores modulate the, the gut in a favorable way for metabolism by increasing things like short chain fatty acid. And then of course, sealing the gut so we don't have the leaky gut driving all the metabolic dysfunction, right? What we saw in a 90 day period, and, and we were specific that they don't change anything about their diet. They're not adding in any exercises. So they're doing all the exact same behaviors that kept them overweight and kept them gaining weight. In the 90 day period, by just taking a probiotic and a prebiotic, we saw almost a 30% reduction in visceral fat mass. Wow. Right? So these people experience a huge reduction in the amount of fat around their midsection. <clears throat> At the same time, we saw all of these biochemical markers for a significant improvement in insulin, in insulin uh, function and gl blood glucose uh, metabolism, right? So we started to see a reverse of the process of going into insulin resistance. We also saw a significant reduction in inflammatory markers in the body and, and overall, and in some cases, we also saw an increase in lean body mass wow. and they were not working out, right? So we were reverting their system back to how humans are supposed to naturally be lean, muscular, and, and um, you know, able to sustain yourself for periods of long, long periods of time without having to eat, right? Because we have all of this fat we can burn for fuel stored on our system. Um, and, and not feeling that constant hunger and all that. So based on the surveys, we were finding that people's eating habits who were in the treatment group, and these were blinded, so they don't know that they're in treatment group, neither do the researchers, they were automatically starting to change some of their eating habits because their microbiome was creating different responses, right? Wow. They, they would start by the end of that third month, eating less, less frequently, snacking less, and so on. So we were getting some of those reports as well. So you can absolutely change the lifelong struggle with metabolism by making the right changes in the microbiome. Yeah, this is so fascinating. And we were talking a little bit before we started the recording of, you know, I've been doing some gut health testing myself and I've had a lifelong struggle with weight. I've lost a hundred pounds three separate times. 
the last time was 10 years ago. And I've just said, I'm never going to put this weight back on, but it's been so difficult. And to hear this is like, it's like just this big relief because <laughs> when I did get the gut health test back, it said, you know, you have a hundred percent chance your gut microbiome has a hundred percent match to someone who is heavy. Yeah. And at first I was like, well, that's a great marketing <laughs> Uh, great way to make me feel terrible about myself. But then yeah. when I really dove into more of the research around microbiome and metabolism, it actually was very like, okay, well, at least now I know I'm going to, you know, keep doing what I'm doing with mm -hmm. the prebiotic, probiotic and the mega mucosa. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> Let's just hope that we, we see a light at the end of the tunnel here, you know, without totally, yeah. struggle so hard. Yeah. That's the key. I mean, to me, there's two very good pieces of good news out of this, right? One is it's not genetic. So mm -hmm. it's not like your genes destined you to be overweight, right? Um, and, and a lot of people thought that for a while because you see it in family lineages, right? Yes. You see heavy parents, heavy kids, and so on. It's not because of the genetics. We know that from the twin studies, and there's lots of twin studies. It's because of the types of microbiome that the pa parents are passing down to their kids, uh, right? Yeah. So you will pass on an, a, a pro-obese microbiome to your children if you are harboring a pro-obese microbiome. So then Got they it. have a tendency to be overweight as well. So, so that is where that lineage comes from. But it's not genetics, which is good because if it's not genetics, it can change, right? Yes. There's no reason why it can't change. And number two is you shouldn't have to struggle. It should not be that hard, right? right. And that's where we've really... Uh, uh, you know, we've really kind of gone haywire because we've made it to a point where, um, you know, being lean and being healthy uh, of healthy weight means, you know, eating basically uh, boiled fish and steamed broccoli and hopes and dreams and nothing else. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and then being at the gym two hours a day. Right. Right. That's not how we're designed. Right. We, right. we did, our ancestors did not have a gym. Uh, they were, they were lean and healthy and, and muscular uh, and flexible all of their life for the most part. And of course, they're living, their lifespan was much shorter too, but, but they were doing that just because naturally that's how we are designed to be. Um, you know, and so when you look at hunter-gatherer tribes and all that, they're all lean and muscular all mm -hmm. the time, right? Even in their, in their 50s and so on, they remain lean and muscular. Uh, that's the natural tendency of humans. But we're not for the most part, because of the dysbiosis that our right. guts have, right? There's, there's a signature to the obese microbiome and, and a large part of the population harbors it. Um, yeah. That's why we...